Let's now step back and take a look at what we've learned so far in terms of trying to find an analog to Gauss's law for magnetic fields. Now, it, if we think about the logic of what we went through last time, went through last time very carefully, something very interesting emerges. We began with the Biot-Savart law, which you can think of as having been first observed and uh, uh, derived, if you will, through experimental observations or as summarizing experimental observations. We are also able to argue for this type of a law from relativistic considerations on charges moving through wires. This law, though, that we have, I've written it here in the wire form, we know, though, can't be complete. It's one of these interesting situations in a field theory where you've got a very successful equation, but you know within it it contains its own sorts of contradictions. So we know this can't be the complete full story because, after all, if you look at how the Biot-Savart law is set up, it has this issue again of action at a distance, right? This equation here would imply that when I've got a wire and I turn on the current, that instantaneously there's going to be a magnetic field somewhere, violating all kinds of relativistic considerations. So we know that this can't be the entire story, but we're looking to try to complete that story by finding a way to express this law that does not involve action at a distance so that we can explain all of these experimental observations but not have this inherent contradiction within our equation. To do that, we then began to exploit the, here, let me clean up this a little bit. To do that, we're going to exploit the structure of this law. Here it's written in its integral form. Of course, we can write it in our favorite form as a sum over the moving charges, where we pull out this factor of epsilon naught and produce an extra copy of it down here. But otherwise, the sum on QIVI is the integral IDL, and all of the other constants and factors all line up. What's useful about this form, as we saw, is that this internal piece looks like just the cross product of the velocity of the ith particle with the electric field that that uh, uh, particle generates. And we just have our prefactor sitting out here in front. The advantage of this is that we know a lot about the mathematical structure of electric fields. And so this gives us something that we can manipulate quite easily. So our goal then was to seek some kind of differential equation that explains the above, that comes from the Biot-Savart law, but that because it's a differential equation, it won't have any action at a distance within it, and the law that we find this way then has some real uh, probability of actually being correct. The idea again is to use this philosophical objection we have to action at a distance, combine it with our experimental observations, and then learn something new out of it. So that was the program we were carrying forth. We we're trying to find some differential equation that uh, related to the Biot-Savart that we can use to replace it. We began by guessing at the divergence because that worked for electric fields and gave us Gauss's law. So we calculated actually the divergence of this expression. And we found very interestingly that the divergence actually is just zero. We can convert this statement into an integral form Either way you look at it, it looks like the electric field Gauss's law, but we notice there are, no, there are never any enclosed charges in our integral equation. Therefore, what we are saying, since there's no magnetic charges, or the other way of saying this is that there are no magnetic monopoles. That's an observation of uh, physics that we have. So that came out very nicely from our, our law. But it doesn't link yet the magnetic field to the current, which of course was our initial goal in the first place. So then we began to think, well, this cross product seems to appear a lot in magnetic field theory. That seems to be inherent in the structure of magnetic interactions. So let's try a differential equation involving something that looks like a cross product, in other words, the curl. We then proceeded to take the curl of our expression for the magnetic field V, and we found something very interesting came out. In fact, two terms came out. The first term I was very excited about. The first term then links directly to the current density, and that's a wonderful result. It's got mu times current density. It looks a lot like Biot-Savart, right? It's got mu times currents in here. So we're very pleased with this aspect of the result. Then there was this additional term that comes out with this very small prefactor, mu naught, epsilon naught. Both of these are tiny quantities when multiplied together you know, we'll keep this little quiet secret between us, but it's actually equal to 1 over c squared. So it's a very tiny quantity. 
So there's this rather small correction factor that appears on the end. And so what we'd like to do is begin to understand this uh, term here better. And we'll be looking at that in discussions coming up. But in the meanwhile, just these first two terms give us something that also we can begin to learn to exploit that will become the direct analog of what we consider just to be the simple Gauss's law for electric fields.